Well, welcome everybody to the I'm a Calgarian webinar hosted during Creek Fest Reimagined. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tracy Lee and I work for the Mistakis Institute, which is a research institute that's affiliated with Mount Royal University. And before I get going on introducing all our presenters and the Calgary Captured program, we're just going to have a quick tech overview. So today we are using Zoom meetings. And so because of that, I'm going to ask you to keep yourself muted and your video off unless you are a presenter. And you should see our four presenters on video screen already. We will be using the chat box to answer any questions. And we feel free to type in your questions during the presentations, but we will address questions at the end of all four presentations. And if you make sure you select the box for everybody in the chat box, then uh, we can all see your questions. All right, so let's get started. Um, Calgary Captured, or the I'm a Calgarian webinar today is brought to you by Calgary Captured. Calgary Captured is a um, online, or Calgary Captured is an urban wildlife monitoring project that is managed by the Mistakis Institute and the City of Calgary jointly, and it's in partnership with the Weaselhead Glenmore Park Preservation Society, the Friends of Fish Creek, and um, Alberta Environment and Parks. And through this project, we've been working on messaging that we think will help Calgarians live better with wildlife in their city. And so today we're kind of launching this campaign that we've created, and we're gonna do that through a series of short presentations with some of our partners. So you're gonna hear from Holly, who's going to talk about coexisting with beavers. Then we're going to turn to Barb from Calgary Parks, who's going to teach us about some of our native pollinators. Andy from the Weaselhead Glenmore Park Preservation Society is going to talk to us about watershed stewardship and how that impacts biodiversity. And then we're going to come back to me and I'm going to talk about how you can join Calgary Captured and help us with our wildlife monitoring. So before we turn over to Holly, the I'm a Calgarian campaign was really designed to help us all better understand how we can live with wildlife in urban environments. It consists of a series of postcards on different species that you see in the city of Calgary, especially if you're someone that visits the parks, you've probably seen many of these species. We are launching one postcard per week through our social media, all the partners through Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can see on the screen here, our first postcard, which was put out last week, is a white-tailed deer image from one of our remote camera images in the Calgary Captured program that you're going to learn a little bit more about later. And then on the back of each card, it gives you a list of uh, ways that you can help or better coexist with animals on, in, the, in the urban environment. Friendly advice, shall we say. Now, I said that one card was being released a week. We have released the white-tailed deer card and the coyote card, and I hope you've both you've seen those two cards. If not, you can visit this website on the bottom of the screen, www.rockies.ca slash I am a Calgarian, and you can actually sneak peek all the cards or review the ones that have already been released. And luckily today, throughout our presentations, you uh, will be given a little treat from each of the presenters. We'll show you one of the cards. So without further ado, I am going to now pass the, uh, the reins over to Holly from the Mistakis Institute. So if you'll just give me one quick minute, we will transition. Take it away, Holly. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Perfect, I'm getting some thumbs up here. So I'm just gonna start my presentation, there you go. Okay, so as Tracy mentioned, I work with her at the Mistakis Institute. I'm a conservation analyst there. Um, one of the projects that I work on is putting beavers to work for watershed resiliency and restoration. So this is a partnership project uh, that we have with Cows and Fish, the Alberta Riparian Habitat Management Society. I'm so excited to share the preview, the sneak, sneak peek of the beaver postcard. Of course, I mean, that one's kind of my favorite, but I like, I like all of them. Um, and we're gonna go over some of the features 
um, that are on the postcard today in a little bit more detail. So let's start with some beaver biology. So this is Castor canadensis. This is the North American beaver. It's one of two beaver species in the world, the other being the Eurasian beaver, um, which lives in parts of Europe and then was introduced into Argentina. Uh, so beavers are semi-aquatic mammals, meaning that they spend half of their life in the water and the other half on land. Um, on average, they can weigh about 45 pounds. Um, and as some of you may know, beavers were actually um, hunted and trapped nearly to extinction between about the 1500s to the 1900s uh, for the fur, fur trade, mostly for the production of uh, top hats in Europe. So looking into uh, more biology on the beavers here, um, a typical colony or family is about two to six beavers. So you'll have the two parent beavers, um, the two young beavers from, from this year, and then two older beavers from the previous year. So those older beavers will actually stay with their parents for about two years uh, while they conduct their apprenticeship with their parents, learning how to be a productive beaver, how to build dams, how to build lodges, how to store food for the winter. And when it's time for them to move on, they can disperse actually over 15 kilometers away from their home base. And sometimes, uh, sometimes the father beaver, the male beaver, will actually go and help his young ones set up their new home base as well. Um, and just to cover all our bases here, um, beavers build both dams, which you'll see on the top of the screen, and then they build lodges as well. So the dams are to store water, uh, which helps them move around the property easier um, and protects them from predators as well. And then lodges act as their shelter. So some of the benefits that beavers provide us um, are enhanced groundwater storage. So you can see in the graphic here, only about 15% of the water um, can, that beavers store can be seen as surface water. About the other 85% is water stored in the ground. So when you see a beaver pond, just imagine how much additional water is stored within the groundwater. They also help filter sediments and pollutants out of the water, as well as mitigating some of the impacts of not only drought, but also flood. And specifically regarding stream benefits, um, Dams really act as speed bumps in the stream system. So what that does is it uh, slows the streams down. Um, it makes them uh, less powerful, which decreases erosion. It cools stream temperature, so that groundwater release into the stream um, in, the, in the hot, dry summer uh, cools the stream temperature down. And it can actually increase annual flows by about two to 10 times, depending on the stream system. And of course, here are some familiar benefits that a lot of us are aware of is both habitat creation and how they enable biodiversity to occur on the landscape. So both of these are examples of endangered species here in Canada and um, beavers. They, of course, rely on beavers um, to provide some of the habitat requirements that they need. But beavers can pose some concerns, as I don't know if many of you have been walking around the Marshall Springs area in Fish Creek Provincial Park, but uh, they have been quite industrious recently. Um, and you'll probably see a lot of trees that look like this. Um, and beavers can also cause a lot of flooding um, of agricultural areas, um, grazing areas, uh, crops, that sort of thing, as well as flooding of trails and road systems. So how exactly can we coexist with beavers harmoniously? Well, thankfully, there are quite a few tools at our disposal that we can use. Um, so the first example of this is a culvert protector. Uh, so beavers love to plug culverts. To them, it basically looks like a dam that's 90% complete. So they just have to plug the leak, which is essentially the culvert. So they do this quite quickly. Um, people usually have to clear culverts. Uh, usually once a week uh, if a beaver is really trying to, to plug that. And then the culverts often run under roads or trails. So usually when a beaver plugs that culvert, it'll start flooding the adjacent road or trail because the water has nowhere else to go. Um, so a culvert protector is a good solution to this. Um, they're easy to install and then you don't have to send out your maintenance crews to clear it weekly. 
And then there's also the installation of beaver proof culverts, um, which funnel the sound of the running water upwards so the beavers don't have as much of a desire to plug. Um, and then they also can't swim because um, there's they can't swim with sticks up into the culvert because there's a great covering it there. Another tool that we have at our disposal um, is to regulate water levels. So this is a diagram of a pond leveler. So essentially in areas where beavers are active, um, they can have a pond that is adjacent to a road, a trail, a building, um, like I said, cropland, that sort of thing. And pond levelers will act as an overflow drain. Um, so you'll see here, let me just get my mouse over here. You'll see the outlet end of the pipe, wherever that is, the height that is set in the dam, that will be the maximum pond level height. Um, so you can control how deep your pond is and, um, and then thus controlling how, how big of an area is being flooded by that, that beaver pond. Um, so it's quite a neat tool and I have another picture to show you here of one actually being installed. So um, on our website, I'll post the link up in a little bit, um, but there's videos on how these are actually installed. They're quite, quite neat to look at. Um, and you can see like here's the, the inlet side, so that gets sunk into the pond. The beavers can't swim into that cage and plug it with sticks, but fish are still allowed through uh, because the holes are quite large. They're six by six inch. Um, and then, of course, this is draining, draining the pond now just a little bit to bring down the flooding from that adjacent road there you can see. So another tool that we have in our disposal, and again, um, a lot of you, if you've wandered around Fish Creek Park or several of the other parks in the city of Calgary, um, there's a lot of trees being wired. Um, and this is actually really good protection against beavers uh, when it's done properly. So the city of Calgary, um, Calgary Parks has put out a video on how to wire trees properly, and they um, have a process uh, where they can monitor uh, the wiring here to make sure that it's still being effective. And the last technique I want to talk about today for coexistence is a textural repellent. So we're actually going to be trying to pilot this technique in that Marshall Springs area of Fish Creek Park this summer. So essentially, um, it it's not too technical. It is uh, mixing sand into latex paint and then painting the trees up, uh, up the trunk about four feet. Um, and this is, um, there's been a lot of evidence saying that this will deter beavers from chewing the trees because they don't like that gritty feeling on their teeth um, when they begin to chew through it. And like I mentioned earlier, here is a link to our um, website, our beaver website. And what we try to do there is we're really trying to build a community of practice. So um, coexistence happens when we see behavioral change and when we can share these lessons learned with each other, it just makes it so much easier for us to coexist peacefully with beavers um, and efficiently. And so there's lots of landowner resources up there. Um, and I encourage you to check out the website and you can sign up for our mailing list too, where we uh, put out new information on different tools and that sort of thing. And then I just wanted to highlight um, something from the, the postcard, a way that we can really help um, our coexistence with beavers. And this is our changing our own behavior. So please remember to respect a beaver's face, watch them from a distance. Um, if they start slapping their tail on the water, that means they're a little bit stressed. So you might want to back up a little bit. And the best thing you can do is please keep your dogs on a leash. Uh, don't allow them to enter the water because this is not only for the safety of the beaver, uh, but also for the safety of the dog as well. So I just want to quickly thank our funders, the Alberta Government Watershed Resiliency and Restoration Program and the Calgary Foundation. And then here is my contact info and I'll put my email up in the chat as well. And I think I'll just pass it back to Tracy. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, we're now going to transition to Barb from Calgary Parks, who's going to talk to us about native pollinators. Barb, you should be set up to go here.
Barb? Uh, yeah, it's just I'm having trouble sharing my screen with you. Okay. Holly, can you unshare yours and we'll see if Barb? Thank you. Could you try again now, Barb, please? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Can you see it now? Yes, we can, Barb. Thank you so much. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Perfect. Thank you so much. Perfect. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Barbara Kowalczyk and I am with the City of Calgary Parks Department. And today I'll be speaking about the importance of pollinators and how the city is working to naturalize some of our parks and open spaces and how we ourselves can create habitat for pollinators in our own backyards by incorporating native plant species. Uh, the City of Calgary has a goal of restoring 20% of Calgary's open spaces by 2025 and you may have heard that we were recently certified as a B city. So what this means is that as a municipality we're committed to protecting pollinators and their habitats. And the work we've done over the past few years to naturalize some of our parks uh, has largely allowed us to attain this certification. So just a brief overview of what naturalization is. Um, very simply, it's uh, the process of converting an area back to a natural state such that the vegetation represents that of the ecoregion. Uh, for many years in Alberta, the ability to afford and maintain a lawn was really a sign of affluence. But we're now realizing that lawns and these expansive turf areas don't support biodiversity at all um, or popul pollinator populations. Um, these turf areas also require a massive amount of input in terms of water and weeding uh, and pesticides uh, that can cause a lot of harm to pollinator populations that may actually be struggling to find the appropriate resources in an urban setting. So there are a lot of benefits to naturalization. Uh, not only does it decrease energy consumption and reduce maintenance, uh, but it also helps improve soil, air, and water quality. Uh, it helps increase awareness of the importance of biodiversity, and it provides opportunities for education and environmental stewardship. And obviously, one of the largest benefits of naturalization uh, is that it provides food and habitat for pollinators. So when we think about pollinators, oftentimes bees come to mind, uh, but there's actually dozens of different insects and animals that provide pollination services. Uh, the fact that most of the food we consume requires pollination uh, makes these critters particularly important to us. So uh, pollinators are facing a lot of challenges. I think we all know that. Uh, one of which is climate change. Um, and the spring emergence of some of our pollinator species is actually becoming mismatched to the flowers that have evolved to attract them. And this is a problem for many of our native bees, uh, which are specialists. So bees that have long tongues, for example, feed on deep blooms. And bees that have short tongues uh, are specialized to get pollen and nectar from shallow blooms. And if these flowers aren't available, there aren't resources for our pollinators, obviously. Um, fragmented landscapes are also a huge issue for pollinators uh, and many human land use practices uh, like draining wetlands, um, our huge expanse of lawns, uh, converting agricultural land is also causing a lot of problems for our pollinators. Um, and also, as we have migrated around the globe and taken uh, plants and animals with us, we've also spread uh, pests and diseases that a lot of our local pollinators haven't evolved mechanisms to defend themselves from. So uh, obviously we know that uh, chemicals can be very dangerous for pollinators, uh, especially neonics. And I was really surprised to learn that uh, neonics are actually 7,000 times more toxic to bees uh, than is DDT. So that was, that was an eye opener for me. So there are a lot of bees in the world, uh, obviously many of which are in decline, but I wanna talk about bees in Alberta and more specifically in Calgary. Uh, so we know there are about 300 species, give or take. Um, and in Alberta, we have a really diverse but largely unknown bee fauna. 
So the knowledge has a lot of value for a lot of different stakeholders. And many of uh, the City of Calgary's naturalization projects uh, that provide food and habitat for pollinators give us the capacity for generating and communicating a lot of different knowledge. Uh, we know where our bees occur locally and geographically, but we really only have baseline knowledge. Um, and some of our city naturalization projects are uh, telling us what our local bees like to forage on. And preferred forage, if we know more about that, that will really uh, lend to the types of projects that we go forth with. So the City of Calgary has actually performed over 250 different naturalization projects across the city. Uh, and I would just like to highlight this one. It's become known as the Bee Boulevard. Um, and this one is actually down on Canyon Meadows Drive. And it's a great example of how the city is working to reimagine some of our open spaces. Um, not only such that they provide habitat for pollinators, uh, but they provide learning opportunities for the local community. And they also give people an example of different native plant species that they can put into their yards. So this project was actually a collaboration uh, between the Roads and the Parks Departments at the City of Calgary, uh, as well as Mount Royal and the UFC, and the David Suzuki Foundation. So community involvement, uh, leveraging of budget and resources resulted in an absolutely fantastic project. Uh, most of the structures were made of recycled materials, so logs uh, from tree clearing for new pathways, uh, sandstone boulders from developments, for example. We were able to engage some of the local elementary schools uh, through educational talks. And then the students actually came out and planted at the site, and the David Suzuki Foundation gave all the students milkweed seeds to take home and plant on their own properties. So here you can see uh, the main pollinator bed as well as some of the bee homes and some of the native species that were planted at, uh, at the site. Um, a lot of people have the impression that native plants aren't attractive and this isn't the case at all. Um, in this instance, we really needed to choose species that were drought tolerant um, and salt tolerant because we were planting on the roadways. Um, and getting wildflower seed uh, commercially and as well as forb is really, really difficult. So most of the wildflowers that we use on these projects are actually from uh, the City of Calgary's uh, propagation project that grows from Calgary collected seed uh, and harvests and cleans it using modified agricultural equipment. So in 2019, we were lucky enough to be part of a bee study in conjunction with the U of C. And a pollinator expert from the UFC helped design um, some of the planting beds on that bee boulevard as well as the bee houses. And they conducted an inventory of the bees in Calgary um, and examined the floral preferences to hopefully better inform some of our plantings and restoration work going forward. And this study found uh, over a thousand bees, uh, 60 different species, uh, and including the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee, uh, which is actually endangered. So just a really great illustration of how these types of projects can contribute to knowledge about our native pollinators. So I've spoken about uh, what we currently know and the steps the city is taking, but what can we do in our own backyards? Well, we can provide habitat and forage, uh, which a lot of our native pollinators are desperately in need of in urban areas. So we have a lot of information about private yard naturalization on uh, the City of Calgary website, um, as well as how you can plant for pollinators on your yard uh, without contravening any bylaws, and information about planting the right native plants in the right places for the type of property uh, and soil and sun exposure that you have. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of great resources online uh, about uh, specific species that do well uh, for in clay soil or acidic soil, for instance. Uh, some of our botanists have worked on soil handling documents, as well as created huge lists of native plant species that are appropriate for this area uh, and do well in different growing conditions. And this is our Calgary Captured uh, pollinator document, which I'm so proud of. Uh, and it just kind of uh, highlights some of the pollinators in our area. A lot of the times, the bigger, uh, sexier species get all the attention. And we want people to know that pollinators are just as important and just as worthy of our conservation efforts. And give people some information about native pollinators and what we can do in our own backyards to help ensure that their populations uh, are there for the future. 
So thank you very much. I appreciate you letting me speak today, and I hope I have given you some helpful information. Thank you so much, Barb. Okay, we're going to go to Andy. I'm just going to set her up here. Okay, Andy, see if that works for you, please. Okay, can everybody hear me? We're good. Awesome. All right, so thank you so much, Tracy, for hosting us and for Holly and Barb with their awesome presentations. My name is Andy Antel and I'm with the Weaselhead Glenmore Park Preservation Society and I'm going to talk about water stewardship today. So if you're wondering why I'm talking about water, um, a panel of a talk about urban wildlife and, that, and how to coexist with urban wildlife is because water and the river, healthy water and healthy rivers mean healthy wildlife and that's something that I'm going to really try to drive home today. So before I get any further, the Weaselhead Glenmore Park is located on Treaty 7 land and I'm on Treaty 7 land right now. Um, I recognize with this webinar people could be watching from anywhere in the province, um, possibly out of the country, who knows, um, but I'm on Treaty 7 land right now, so is the Weaselhead, and that's really important for me to mention um, before any sort of presentation, before any sort of talk, but especially right now, there's a lot of social justice movements happening right now, and I want to emphasize that environmental movements can be related to all these amazing social justice movements that are happening. Uh, caring for the land, caring for the water, caring for the animals can be the same thing as honoring black lives, indigenous lives, and people of color. Those can be connected. So I just wanted to mention that. So this is the Weaselhead Park. Here's what it looks like. If you've never been, I highly recommend it. Um, the Elbow River flows through it and the Glenmore Reservoir is right there as well. So beautiful, beautiful place. And as I'm talking about water today, um, I'm gonna take you, you all on a little bit of a journey of what's happening in the Weaselhead right now, what's happening with our water. And that is the construction of the Southwest Calgary Ring Road. So this is something that's impacting Fish Creek as well. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know about this and what's going on. The construction began in fall of 2016 and it's expected to be complete in 2021. And we're concerned about this in the Weaselhead for a couple of different reasons. Um, one of those reasons being wildlife movement. A beautiful thing about the Weaselhead is that it connects to the Satina land. And that means it's a really, really important area. It's a really important wildlife corridor um, because Satina land goes all the way to the Rocky Mountains. So it's an amazing spot for wildlife to enter the city and go to the mountains and vice versa. Um, and the road is being built right at that border. So um, part of the Weaselhead, part of our connection to the Mustakis Institute and Calgary Captured is we do have cameras set up at that wildlife corridor at that crossing um, so we can monitor who's using it um, and how that construction is going to impact that as well as how that's going to change when the road is built itself. We're also concerned about noise pollution. Uh, many species in the Weaselhead rely on sounds to communicate, whether that's songbirds or boreal coarse frogs with breeding and mating, even distress signals, as well as nocturnal animals like bats using echolocation. And last but not least, we are concerned about water quality. And like I said, healthy water means healthy wildlife. And I'm just going to go through some aerial photos right now. So this is 21 years ago, definitely pre-construction. This is the weasel head of June 1999, um, the Weaselhead Glenmore Park Preservation Society was founded in 1994, so uh, quite an old photo. Moving forward to July 2014, again, still pre-construction, and moving into what construction has looked like. This is from April of 2018. So it's quite extreme, it's quite drastic. Um, this is of course much like way more zoomed in than the previous photo I showed, but you can really, really see the impact of just how much sediment and how turbid this construction process is. Uh, 1.2 kilometers of the Elbow River had to be rerouted to allow for this road design. So that means that they took 1.2 kilometers of the Elbow River, moved it, constructed a channel for that water to flow through and filled, filled in the old channel, its natural channel. So quite, um, quite extreme. <laughs> this is 
again, just a little more zoomed in what that construction looks like. This photo here, this is where um, that wildlife crossing is. So right now, not looking very inviting. Um, again, we have cameras, so we'll be monitoring who's using it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you can just really see how intense this process is, how, how much we're putting on the wetlands, how much pressure we're, we're putting on the wetlands right now to filter our water with all this excess sediment coming in. One of the wetlands that I want to talk about a little bit is the beaver pond in the weasel head. So um, the beaver pond is controlled by beavers. It's beaver habitat. Um, they control the pond. They control the ephemeral streams that run into and out of the pond. And at the edge of the pond, at the shore of the pond, is where a lot of construction activity is taking place. And uh, you can see in that photo there, there's lots of sediment, lots of construction happening right at the shore of that pond. And there have been a few instances of spills of sediment directly into the beaver pond. So um, the construction company does have measures in place to prevent that from happening. Um, nonetheless, it has happened anyways. Uh, a few instances in 2018 and 2019 and one so far this year in 2020. Um, high rain events and big storms have sort of led to the the deposit of sediment into the pond. And what we're doing in the Weasel Head about that, what our role in water stewardship is right now is collecting data and doing research. So we are working on an impact study. And our aim within this study is to, is to really be able to showcase a trend of how impacting the water is impacting the rest of the ecosystem, as well as the wildlife in the park. So, we're, be, we're working on that right now. It's a seven year long study. We are in the um, during construction phase of data collection. We started with um, some baseline data to really get some accurate comparisons. We collected data before construction began in 2015 and uh, 2016. So right now we're collecting data in this during construction phase and we will continue to collect data after construction. And once the road is up and running, um, so we'll go into 2022. If the road isn't finished by 2021, um, then we'll have to extend that further. But our aim is also to provide some better uh, ways to mitigate uh, in the long term and in the short term the impacts of this construction. So we're not looking at just water quality, we're looking at terrestrial habitats, like breeding birds, noise pollution, riparian vegetation, and wildlife movement, and aquatic habitats, which includes water quality, but also looking at species, aquatic invertebrates, amphibians, and fish. So within the water quality parameters, we're looking at abiotic factors like turbidity or measure of water clarity, how clear or how murky the water is, temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, which is a measure of acidity or how basic the water is, salinity and conductivity, so water's ability to conduct a current, which tells us how much dissolved ions there are in the water, or dissolved salts, which is a direct measure of pollution, as well as nutrient levels like chloride, nitrate, and phosphate. And we're looking at biotic factors, so our bioindicator species that we have in the park, uh, bioindicator species, their presence or their absence in the ecosystem tells us something about the health of that ecosystem. So two aquatic invertebrate bioindicator bio species that we have are caddisflies and mayflies. Um, and these photos are not to scale, by the way. Um, so they are both aquatic invertebrates, caddisflies, which is this one, this first one that popped up here. They build little homes for themselves, which is really cool. They use vegetation, sticks, spruce needles, and they kind of build a protective little net for themselves. Um, dragonfly nymphs or dragonfly larvae like to predate on them, so that's their little protection. And mayflies are these ones here. So both caddisflies and mayflies cannot live in polluted water. They are super sensitive to it. So if you find mayflies or caddisflies in the water, that's an indication of healthy water. So they're a positive bioindicator. We also look at side swimmers or scud or freshwater shrimp. They have three names. 
and they cannot live in water with low levels of oxygen. So again, they're another positive bioindicator. Some of the amphibians that we look out for are boreal coarse frogs and wood frogs. So amphibians are super sensitive species. Um, our boreal coarse frog population has been a little bit in flux, but it's hard. Um, we're being very careful not to jump to any conclusions because our study is not complete yet and wetlands are very resilient ecosystems. And wood frogs are a Calgary captured featured animal. They are Calgarians too. And I am pleased to say that our wood frog population um, from the data we've collected so far, our wood frogs have not been impacted by the construction um, or the sediment spills into Beaver Pond. They're still doing well and we're happy, we're happy to hear them and see them around. So some of our findings so far, so in terms of the abiotic findings, those spills into the beaver pond did have immediate impacts, um, including visible changes of turbidity. Um, we're expecting longer term effects as well, but again, we're still in that data collection phase and can't make any solid conclusions so far. Um, we have noted significant increases of conductivity as well as pH in both beaver pond and beaver lagoon. Um, and we are linking that to those spills that happened. And in terms of the biotic findings, it is a little bit too early to detect the consequences of those changed water, that changed water chemistry and how uh, the species will respond. Um, again, wetlands are really, really resilient and it is their role in the ecosystem to filter pollutants out of the water. Um, so we are expecting well, I am expecting the wetland to bounce back, but we're putting a lot of pressure on it right now. Um, so that's why we need to continue doing our research and see what this impact really is. So within our monitoring over the next three years, we'll be able to see that trend more clearly and see um, if our sensitive species are able to survive or if there will be any potential local extirpation of those species. And it can be a little bit discouraging to hear what's happening in the weasel head right now and to see that this construction is going on and, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. But there are things that you can do to help. There are ways to coexist with water. So, again, this presentation is not as much as coexisting with urban wildlife as it is coexisting with our rivers that we have in the city because the Elbow River, the Bow River, those are Calgarians too. They are part of our identity of Calgarians. They're where our drinking water comes from. They come out of our taps. We use them for everything. Um, so we're intimately connected with them and we need to consider them our neighbors too. And ways that we can coexist with this water is to recreate responsibly. I'm kind of assuming most people who are watching this webinar are people who like to go to Fish Creek, um, potential cyclists listening. And my advice is to avoid cycling on dirt trails if you can um, because that does contribute to soil erosion which damages vegetation and vegetation absorbs water and when you have lots of rain and not a lot of vegetation to absorb that water that increases runoff that increases sediment into the water and increases potential flooding other ways to help out include volunteering if the impact study i just talked about is interesting to you at all we're always looking for extra hands um, we're always looking for bird experts or invertebrate experts. Um, and even if you're not an expert, if you're just interested and want to help out, um, you can jot down that email at the bottom of the screen here. That's my coworker, Lisa. She is the, um, the coordinator for this study. So we're always looking for helpers. And I'd like to just end with a quote. Uh, so this is from a book. Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. So she says that each person, human or not, is bound to every other in a reciprocal relationship. Just as all beings have a duty to me, I have a duty to them. If an animal gives its life to feed me, I am in turn bound to support its life. If I receive a stream's gift of pure water, then I am responsible for turning a gift in kind. An integral part of a human's education is to know those duties and how to perform them. So again, the Elbow River is a Calgarian too. It gives us a gift every single day and it's our, dirty, our duty to return that gift. Thank you so much for listening.
Great, thank you, Andy, so much. We have our last presentation, which is me. <laughs> okay. Okay, everyone, thank you. Those are some great presentations. This is the last one, and then we'll get to some questions. So again, I'm Tracy from the Mustakis Institute. I'm gonna to talk to you guys today about Calgary Catcher and how you can help us out. So, here we go. So I just want to remind you that Calgary Captured is a partnership made up of Mistakis, the City of Calgary, Alberta Environment and Parks, Friends of Fish Creek, and the Weaselhead Glenmore Park Preservation Society. And we couldn't do this work without the generous funding of the City of Calgary, Alberta Ecotrust, the Calgary Foundation, and TD Friends of the Environment. So just a special shout out. So the objectives for the Calgary Captured program are to determine which species, it's, it's quite simple actually, which species do we have occurring in Calgary and where do they occur? And we want to have that documented. We'd like to gain a better understanding of how animals move around and respond to the built environment in our, in our urban environment. And lastly, we just wanted to engage Calgarians in urban wildlife. And I think Andy's point was really well taken. If we want to maintain these things that we love in our city, whether it be a river or animals, we have to invest in their maintenance and their protection. So to meet the first objective of um, what species occur where in the city of Calgary, we set up over 60 remote uh, wildlife cameras around in our urban parks in the city of Calgary. And so you can see, this is Sarah, who's one of our, our techs that manages the helps manage the camera project. And you can see her setting up a remote camera that when wildlife walk by or move or a human or a dog walk by, it triggers a response and we get an image. And so please just imagine how many images in urban parks we actually collect. This is a reminder, this is the city of Calgary. Um, just to orient yourself, this is the big ring road going the Sony Trail going all the way around the city of Calgary. Um, you can see the new construction over here. The areas in yellow are, are natural areas where we have cameras and it includes Fish Creek Provincial Park. Fish Creek is actually a provincial park that occurs in our urban environment. We are so, so lucky in Calgary to have this. This is Nose Hill Park up here. And the areas in green are a connectivity model results. So areas where we think there's still natural connections and animals can still move in our urban environment. And you can see that that tends to be around our large river systems or on the outskirts of the big ring road where we still have a lot of green and we haven't yet developed. So this is what some of the images look like. Uh, from Calgary Captured. These were all captured in Calgary. Some of you may be surprised to know in some of our larger parks, we have cougar and bear. Uh, we also have moose occurring in the city and the most common species, which I'm sure will not surprise any of you, is deer and, um, and then followed by coyote. And this might surprise some of you. We do actually have raccoons. They're my favorite photos because they're always at night. They're always in groups and they're always up to something. <laughs> we do have raccoons uh, in the city of Calgary, which I don't think a lot of people know and hopefully we don't get the ones that are like Toronto where they can get into your compost bins and they have to have special latches. Anyway, I'm not going to show you all the different species we see. If you want to do that, you have to join Calgary Captured and help us classify these images. So if you recall the second objective, other than where are wildlife occurring in the city and which species are there, was how do animals move around the built environment? And so if, if you recall, I showed you those green spaces where we think that animals can move between our natural areas, we'd like to understand if they are actually moving. So modeling tells us it should be possible, but are they actually there? And so we have some cameras now set up between our natural areas and what we are calling wildlife corridors in the city to determine if movement indeed is occurring. And then over time, we want to understand the patterns in animal detection before and after development. Andy presented the results of the ring road. This is really substantial because when they did the environmental impact assessment for the ring road, there was thoughts that wildlife in the city of Calgary don't need to worry about it. So it taught us that we need a data set and we need to understand where wildlife are and how they're using the urban landscape. And then from an engagement perspective, you're seeing that for this I'm a Calgarian campaign that we're introducing today. But the key messages from our partnership are that nature does exist in these large urban areas and that we think we can coexist with wildlife, but we can do better and we should be doing better. 
and that really we need the public support and Calgarian support if we wish to maintain these systems in our city. And this is how you can help us. You can join our Zooniverse project. Zooniverse is a massive citizen science online platform that has hundreds of projects where people, uh, the public, can contribute to research. So the project that we have up there is called Calgary Captured. If you literally type Calgary Captured Zooniverse into, the, into your URL on Google search or on Google search, it will come up with this project. And this is the interface that allows you to help us classify the thousands of images that we collect throughout the city of Calgary. This is what it looks like when you log on to help. You actually don't even have to register. You can register, which gives you a little bit of extra information. You can comment, you can save photos to a favorite gallery. But if you don't want to register, you can just get on and help classify. So you will be given an image like this and you'll be asked to identify what it is and how many of the species were there. There's a really easy tutorial to help you. And if you don't know your species, this is a great way to learn because there's a great wildlife tutorial that teaches you all about the key characteristics you should look for. The thing about Zooniverse is it enables eight different people to observe the same image. So eight different individuals will observe this one image. And if there's a high level of agreement that everyone thinks that's a mule deer, maybe eight, if 8% eight say that's a mule deer, then it's classified. If there isn't strong agreement, it comes into the Mustakis office and we actually verify. Sometimes we also don't know, by the way. Uh, the other thing that's super um, annoying for me <laughs> with the Zooniverse platform is that there's no I don't know. And I really had tr trouble with that. But research, research has shown that if you force individuals to select with their, to the best of their ability, their intuition tends to crack, and it gets you better at kind of thinking through and reading through the wildlife identification and trying to identify. There is a nothing here button. And luckily, if you go on to Zooniverse now, the city of Calgary has uh, developed an artificial intelligence process that scans through all our images and it puts them into bins of blanks, humans, and wildlife. And the ones that get posted up online are all the ones with the wildlife. So there's very few blanks. There's not supposed to be human images. So you guys are lucky. The first people that started helping us a year ago were not so lucky. So how will we use this Calgary Capture data? Well, we want to explore how human activities impact wildlife movement in our parks. And so one of the questions we have is, are species temporarily displaced from trails? Like when we have high human activity, are we displacing um, the wildlife? We'd like to validate this wildlife modeling that shows where we think our corridors are between our natural systems. And really we want a long-term monitoring data set that allows us to assess trends and patterns of these terrestrial wildlife in the city. Because if we don't understand where they are and how they're moving, it's very difficult for us to manage for them. This is just a graph really early on, the first few months of data, showing you the patterns throughout a day. So we've got the hours along the bottom, and this is the number of events. Wildlife is in the green and the humans are in the blue. And so you can see that when humans are peaking activity in our park use, and you can see, you know, around seven morning, we have a, a change from wildlife to, to humans starting to increase their use in our park system. So these are the types of things that will be really useful. I would like to share the messaging about keeping your dog on a leash. It came with a beaver talk of Holly. We see a lot of off-leash dogs on our cameras. And so it would be great if people could try and heed and keep their dogs on leash where they're not on leash or off leash in the parks where they're allowed to be off leash. So what's next? Well, we just have a year's worth of data, quite a lag. So the more you helping us in the universe, the faster we'll get data sets. We uh, have a complete year of data um, as of last week and we've just started to analyze that, but we've played a catch up game and we think by the end of the year, we're gonna have three years worth. So that's really exciting for all our partners. And then we hope to continue to engage all of you through the citizen science um, platform Zooniverse. So that's how we want you to join us, Calgary Capture Zooniverse. Um, I just like to say thank you. And if you want to learn more, like if you're uncomfortable with the technology and you want like a more thorough tutorial on how to use Zooniverse, you can contact Nicole at rockies.ca. She's our, our, our project manager for this project and she would be more than willing to answer any questions or to help you learn how to use that technology. And I'd also like to thank CreeFest um, for uh, putting us on and enabling us to be a part of it. So having said all that, we would now like to invite questions. I'm going to put this slide back up just so you remember the, um, the how to see the other uh, postcards for the I'm a Calgarian campaign because the, the owl one is my favorite. So now you're all going to be tempted to go and see, I'm hoping. Okay, so let, 
Uh, let's open up and see if anyone has questions. And I will encourage all of our um, presenters to be a part of this discussion. I'm just trying to find my chat. I see, oh, here we go, chat, thank you. Okay, so we still have a bit of time. Hopefully you guys can stay on. The first one is um, Holly. It's just a, a suggestion that Lacklebish County might be interested in chatting with you. I don't know if you've talked to them before, or maybe you could just follow up directly with Brian. Yep, thanks for that comment, Brian. And um, I think Calvin Fish has been in discussions um, with Lack Labish, but feel free to shoot me an email and I'd be happy to chat more about that with you. Fantastic. Um, Andy, I think this was my question. I wanted you to confirm my impression. The River Valley used to be one kilometer across, and is it right that now with mitigation it's a hundred meter opening? That's correct. Yes, the wildlife used to have one kilometer to cross through that corridor, and now it's only 100 meters. So they have 10% of what they had before. Okay, well, we're pretty Thank interested you. in finding out what, what's using that. Yeah. Hopefully there'll be a report from, from you guys to, to, on the results. There will. <laughs> and this is a question I think for you as well, Andy. Yeah. Do you have these invertebrates in the weasel head area already like before construction? Absolutely, absolutely. So these invertebrates, um, it is their role in the wetlands as well to, to filter pollutants out of the water. So healthy wetlands means lots of biodiversity, lots of different species of these invertebrates. Um, so within uh, looking for these invertebrates now during the construction phase of our research, um, we're basically looking to see if they're still there, if the population numbers are going down, if we're seeing less biodiversity, things like that. And um, they're kind of like the first indication if we're seeing if we're not seeing these invertebrates in the same way that they were present before construction then that's sort of the first in indication that the ecosystem is changing so absolutely they're they're present before the construction and, and that's what we want to see in the park great thank you um and we have a question that says uh where are the postcards located i'm hoping you could can you guys still see my screen so the postcards, the secret postcard location <laughs> is actually, it's actually not secret, it's on the postcards, but who reads these things quite that closely? So if you see down at the bottom, it says www.rockies.ca slash I am a Calgarian, all lowercase, all one word. That will take you to the postcard spot. I don't know if we have, um, any comments on the daily, oh, sorry, I skipped up here. Any comments on the daily routes that wildlife take in Calgary, distance covered, what are the impediments? What can we do to protect their routes? Um, I can start answering that and then maybe other people can weigh in because obviously it's very different depending on the species. So we just did, um, I'm gonna start with amphibians. We just did a big uh, study of amphibians with the city of Calgary and some other amphibian experts. And what we found is there's some great habitat for amphibians in the city of Calgary. Um, we're, we've got good upland habitat, a number of wetlands that are supporting uh, boreal chorus frogs and frog and, and, and tiger salamander. But that many of these inside that big ring road on Stony Trail are isolated. And they're isolated because of obviously urbanization, but primarily roads, our road network, we just are not at all considering how species need to move um, Across woods. <laughs> so you have potential for good movement, but that road network is a, re is a really big problem. And also neighborhoods that develop stormwater infrastructure and don't think about how that stormwater infrastructure connects into our green spaces. So some big lessons there. Um, we don't have good information on how far some of the terrestrial species are moving. We have a 311 data and we have this remote camera project. So hopefully in the future we'll have a better understanding of that. I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in there. No, okay. What can we learn from all the Calgary captured images that show off these jogs in an on leash area? Um, yes, that's very interesting. So how we're looking at it now is to just identify parks where we maybe know there's a problem. And what's really interesting with the data, and again, this is a very preliminary analysis looking at for three months, is that where there tends to be the biggest problem is where off on leash areas end. So there's kind of a 
people just are creating a really big buffer <laughs> around those areas where you're not supposed to be. And so maybe, maybe it's not clear to people or maybe people just, um, maybe there's just some bad habits, but this is definitely something that I think park management can use. Thank you, Holly has put up. Uh, that's better, Holly, thanks. People can actually click on the link. It's Holly, she's one of the smarter ones in our office, I gotta say. <laughs> Penny, I live a block from Fish Creek Rim Parkland. I see bobcats out here on my road, sidewalk, alley, soccer field. Oh, what about squirrels, geese? They live in my block and in Fish Creek Park. Can we monitor wildlife in our neighborhoods? Yes. You can. If anyone else wants to jump in, Barb, I feel like you might should maybe jump in, but um, I'll just suggest 311. Call 311 or report through the 311 app. Is that a good suggestion, Barb? Sorry, yeah, I was just uh, I was just typing actually um, regarding the on off leash issues. So okay. the city of Calgary has um, environmental educators in some of our key parks where we know that there is issues. So Nose Hill Park, for example, there's a really healthy coyote population and there's a huge issue with on off leash areas um, and people uh, disregarding the bylaws or sometimes it's just that they're unclear. So um, we're working um, obviously with different departments with urban conservation with roads to try to identify some of these parks so we can really target uh, is it an issue of signage is it an issue of education or do we need to pull in some bylaw officers because um, unfortunately from our experience a lot of the time people will disregard those on off leash uh, rules until it hits them in the pocketbook so it certainly is something that we're trying to address um, I'm just looking at the other comments here yeah, if you're if you're interested about monitoring wildlife in your neighborhood, certainly I would suggest um, submitting a 311 uh, so it can go to the appropriate ecologist and urban conservation and they can look at um, if that is a viable option for us. Thanks, Barb. Okay, I think we've I just wanted to add one thing about the 311 request. Um, it's also important to note that you had a positive experience with the wildlife as well. Because um, sometimes through one request can sometimes come, I know from, from beavers, uh, they get a bit of a negative experience uh, with people complaining about the tree cutting and that sort of thing. But there's also a lot of people that see beavers and enjoy seeing them. Um, and then they don't always submit a 311 request. So we're looking for those positive submissions as well. Thank you, Holly. That's a really good point. Um, yeah, I had some trouble putting in a bobcat observation in my neighborhood on 211, but I, I think there was a glitch. I know they're trying to fix that so that you could include other wildlife. I don't know if Barb had an update on that, but, but please continue to check. And yeah, on the 311 app, you can actually upload photos, which is even more desirable because then we know for sure it is a bobcat. <laughs> so that's great. That's great if you can upload photos. That's encouraged. You certainly can. Um, and I know sometimes on the app, um, there are fields that only let you report uh, certain uh, animal sightings. Uh, but you ha if you have the ability to call 311, you can speak to an operator and ensure that your call goes to the appropriate person. Um, whether you want to discuss, we get calls about uh, wanting to discuss uh, bird calls that someone has heard um, and everything in between. So certainly you can submit and it will go to the appropriate person. Great. Well, um, I just want to thank all the presenters for coming today. This was a, a, a fabulous opportunity for us all to share some of the stuff we're really passionate about. And I loved the diversity of the topics and lots of ways. I think you heard hopefully lots of ways that you can get involved today. So hopefully this inspires you. Please visit the I'm a Calgarian campaign website and please share widely um, and look every Wednesday if you want to wait every Wednesday there's a new one release and I don't know what tomorrow it might be pollinators tomorrow does anyone else know I is Barb okay Barb says it's pollinators tomorrow she didn't show you the front so you can now check out the, the social media um, thanks so much everybody for your patience with the link and uh, thanks so much week fast take care we're gonna sign off <laughs>